Thank you for joining us for another episode of Keep It Fictional from the Port Moody Public Library. I am Virginia, and I'm here with my good old book friends, Corinne, Fiona, and Sadie. And we are also joined by Ellison, our brand new Keep It Fictional member. So welcome, Ellison, to the show. Can't wait for all the books that you're going to introduce us to. And this episode is all about you. So why don't you start and tell us a little bit about yourself and what listeners should know about you as a reader? Okay, so hi, uh, my name is Allison. I use they them pronouns. Um, I am a new librarian here at Port Moody Public Library. Um, when I'm not reading, I can often be found playing video games, uh, writing stories, or walking my very small fluffy dog. And about me as a reader, um, I am a big fan of speculative fiction, so science fiction, fantasy, horror, anything that sort of fits in that genre space, but I try and read widely. Um, I try to read some nonfiction. I try to read some literary fiction. I try to read some romance. Um, so I I do try to have a fairly broad uh, reading palette. But when the chips are down, I always return to my favorite genres. So that is a little bit about me. Oh, thank you, Allison. Glad to have another science fiction fantasy horror reader here um so to get to know you a little bit even more we have going to do a round of quick fire questions so as our listeners know in addition to book suggestions every week we also ask ourselves an existential question and sometimes and i would say probably very often they are like shocking revelations and sometimes shocking even to ourselves um yeah and so those are like probably like one of the i, I love those segments because i get to know my book friends quite a bit through them um <laughs> and so um we have chosen don't worry Allison, a few maybe some of the easier ones just to like start you off with um so i'm gonna ask corinne fiona and sadie to also give their answers to the questions because then that way we don't feel like we're just interrogating Allison the whole episode so corinne why don't you kick us off Yes. Yeah, so speaking of like revelatory questions, um, this is one that we talked about and discovered a lot about ourselves and others. So my question for you, Allison, is when you are reading, do you listen to music? Not usually, no. I am a silent reader, if at all. Um, if I if I had to listen to music while I was reading, it would be instrumental music. I've been in choir and other sort of musical pursuits since I was very little. And so when I'm listening to music, my brain just starts paying attention, especially to the lyrics. If there's lyrics, if there's not lyrics, it's paying attention to sort of structural stuff. So I just find music too distracting when I read. Sorry, Green. Mm -hmm. That's fine. It's fine. I'm used to being alone on this one. Um, yeah, so uh, because this is not an interrogation, obviously, um, I'm, as you could tell from my facial expression, I, I don't have a very good poker face when it comes to certain things, is I find it absolutely baffling that people don't listen to music when they read. Baffling. I don't understand it. Um, yeah, I, I, you don't have something going on in the background. Um, I love to read when I'm listening to um any kind of music instrumental words with lyrics i used to read when my dad was watching hockey games um i just i like something else going on in the background so this is again revelatory and it's fine well the amazing thing of corinne uh, oh sorry go ahead city no i was just gonna say that the only thing that i do understand about that is the hockey game i think that i could probably yes. read yes. while there's a hockey game yes. on in the background yes absolutely yeah. yes yes Absolutely. But the amazing brain of Corinne could also process listening to a podcast at the same time as reading, which I find that just amazing. It just shows you how special you are, Corinne. 
compared to the rest of us who can't deal with more than one thing at a time. So, yeah. No? And maybe not for the better. <laughs> My brain just needs a lot of stimulation. <laughs> oh, all right, Sadie. What's your question for Allison? Okay, Allison, you start a book, you're reading it. It's not really your favorite. Do you finish the book or do you stop and put it down and walk away? Now, if you asked me this 10 years ago, I would finish the book, but I have been trying to practice radical acceptance in my life. And that means that I can now accept that sometimes a book is just not for me. And if I have been trying, if I've been struggling, if I have been spending time on this book for a month and I haven't gotten past the first 150 pages, I can now finally say that I will put that book down and walk away without a shred of guilt. All right. I, I feel like I am similar to you where, except if you had asked me 17 and 19 days ago, 17 months and 19 days ago, um, if I, uh, would do the same. I would have also said, no, I would finish it hundred percent. I would push through. I would probably not enjoy it, but I would suffer through that book until the end because I needed to finish it. Um, but yes, I, yeah, same thing. I have just found that I just don't have the time that I used to have. And so I have started putting down books. Now I still don't do this for every book. So I will sometimes suffer through books that I'm not really, really enjoying just for the sake of completing them because I need to I need to check it off. I need to I need to click that I'm finished button on Goodreads. I just I I can't do it. But but I'm getting better and I not as often do I do I uh continue reading if I'm not enjoying. Yeah, if I have an outside reason to finish the book, like if I'm in a book club that's reading the book, I will still finish it. Um, I'm in two sort of online book clubs, and sometimes we read some truly heinous books. Um, one of the book clubs I'm in is a Doctor Who book club, and we are working our way through some some stinkers, shall we say, but we suffer together. All right, shuffle to Allison. <laughs> You're my kind of reader. Fiona! All right. I would like to know um, how much the cover plays into choosing a book for you. Will Do you gravitate towards books with because of the cover? And will you read a book with a bad cover? I definitely find covers interesting. And I think that they influence whether I read a book. I won't necessarily pick up a book just based on the cover, but um, I think it does influence. I will read a book with a bad cover if it's gotten enough buzz from uh, sources that I find reputable, um, be that friends or like if like Tor Books has recommended it really highly. Uh, if I don't like the cover, I'll still read it. Um, this is somewhat tangential, but I really hate uh, movie adaptation covers so I try to avoid those whenever I can but I will still pick up a book and read it if it's got a movie adaptation cover if it's supposed to be really good I wanted to yell bingo when you said tour because I feel like you just like bingoed Virginia reading um um I feel like I'm I'm probably in line with you but like maybe a little bit more on the caring about covers and like I will I will begrudgingly read something with a bad cover um like you know it has to be quite a quite a bit for me to pick it up and like you say like the um theatrical release ones um even if I like it's like it's the same book same on the inside but like if I have to go to a different library or like bookstore like to read that one without the theatrical cover like I will do that because I don't want to hold it in my hands <laughs> All right. Okay. So my question for you, I think I know the answer for this one, but um, do you keep a to be read list? And if you do, is it in a spreadsheet? 
I actually don't keep a to be read list. I have a to be read pile. So I have like piles of books in my room at home and also now on my desk here that are books that I want to read, but I don't have a to be read list outside of like the the pre-generated ones or the ones that you can sort of create on the story graph, which is what I use to track my reading. Um, so no, I do not have a to be read list. And if I did, it would probably not be a spreadsheet. But at the end of the year, I do like to create a spreadsheet um, to track the uh, sort of diversity of the reading that I've been doing because I've been trying to uh, read more diverse authors, try and read fewer dead white men. And I think that's been really interesting just to sort of create that spreadsheet at the end of the year. I think I'm going to cry now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Thank you, Allison. You gave me hope in humanity. Thank you. Um, so now that we've got to know you a little bit better, um, we have the opportunity before the show to ask you for a list of your I, I would I know that you said it's not like necessarily your favorite books, but books that you definitely enjoyed. A lot because I think asking for a list of top 10 favorite books is just mean. Um, but Elson has given us a list of 10 books that they really, really like, and each of us have chosen a book to read from that list. Um, and so we're going to tell you about the book that we picked, um, what we think about it. And then Allison, of course, after our description of the book, you know, we'll find out for you, like, we'll find out from you what you like about the book. And I'm also going to ask my book friends to think about based on that one experience, you know, that experience to help us understand what an Ellison book is. I would love to know, how likely do you think you and Ellison are book twins? Because I feel like we don't have any book twins on this show. Like, of all the people that have, you know, right? Like, no, we have like, I don't know, book cousins? Twice removed, maybe? <laughs> Like, but I, I don't, and some of us don't even belong to the same family. We know who we are, but you know, like, I don't know if we have book twins. So maybe, maybe Allison is one of our book twins. We will find out. All right. So um, Fiona, do you mind letting us know what book you picked from Allison's list? I would love to, um, as usual, apologies if it's a little convoluted. Um, Okay. I was very excited to see this book on um, Allison's list uh, because it's one that has been recommended to me by many other people and also many other lists. Um, I cannot believe that this book was written in the last 10 years because it is on every uh, like must read fantasy list. Um, and I did read it um, um, probably about a year ago, uh, but I picked it up again uh, and and it's I'm struggling with what a different experience I'm having the second time reading it. So um, bear with me as I talk through that. Uh, I am talking about the fifth season by N.K. Jemison. Um, and this is an epic fantasy. Um, I am a big reader. Uh, Ursula K. Le Guin fan and for me kind of epic state fantasy stops a little bit there um, because I do struggle with everything that's going on and more like um, yeah just parsing through uh, these books but that's sort of like my comparison point um, and um, yeah I really enjoyed it a lot um, <laughs> and I think what I've learned is that in a book like this that's so inventive, um, it is a reread. It's one that you probably could read again and again and still get something out of. Um, and you almost have to read it again, uh, or at least I did not having not being oriented the first time to like what was going on and sort of picking up halfway through like, oh, okay, this character is that character and this is how this world goes. Okay, so... Um, this book is set in a world which is presumably not our own, and it is uh, apocalyptic 
in a very inventive way. So um, I'm not a huge fan of apocalyptic fiction, but uh, this definitely, I think, brings up a lot of interesting uh, ideas about the end of the world. Um, and is is yeah, I found it so much more readable than than any other apocalyptic fiction. So we start out uh, by following the character Eason. Uh, and I'm actually going to probably pronounce a lot of these th names wrong, despite having listened to the audiobook. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, she is uh, uh, a middle-aged woman who returns home to uh, find her young son has been beaten to death. So definitely uh, content warning for... Uh, a lot of um for for child mortality for uh child abuse um and just a lot of other heavy subjects uh there's one scene in particular uh that really really upset me uh but I can't describe it now because you need so much more groundwork before I can describe that so um Eason is actually um an origin uh who which is who <laughs> A person who has the ability to control energy um, and uh, this works with ooh, with like earthquakes and stuff. <laughs> they can move ground and earth and it's really cool uh, but it took me a long time to like fully understand um, the limitations of that but there are limitations I love um, how like science based the fantasy is in this it's very cool um, but of course this uh, particular group of uh, people are um, not accepted in society uh, and there's a really interesting power dynamic there because uh, well they are extremely powerful they're not accepted by the society and the society at large has this sort of way of controlling them of like putting them to use and basically enslaving them um, like through this school and with these watchers um, that, that's like br brass tacks I guess um, so Eason's story is really interesting uh, she basically flees this um, town uh, on a search to find her second child who she believes her husband has uh, either killed or kidnapped because he's found out that they um, they are uh, because he's found out that his wife is an origin and he's realized that his son um, was an origin Uh there's she develops some interest relationships with really interesting characters. Uh, this is my favorite um, branch of the story. Uh, there's a young kid um, who I really like. Uh, and then there is uh, a trans woman. Um, and they're just it's that sort of found family in this like wild, wild uh, atmosphere um, with characters that I really loved. Um, the second uh, point of view is Demea. Um, and this is uh, a young girl whose family has also recently found out that she is an origin gene. And um, they, well, they couldn't bear to see her perish. Um, they did call this, like, the, the school, the fulcrum, to come and, like, take her there. Um, so she's dealing with these, like, this realization that her family has abandoned her and and basically hates her and on top and she kind of finds this father figure um uh i think it's shafa uh who starts to like train her to use her um her her skills and and she's like oh awesome like you know this person who cares about me nope he's a bad man <laughs> um and definitely you know like he's he's working for this uh this this school and is uh basically going to break her in in any way that he can to to you know control her powers for um for the the use of the greater society and this is because you know um origin are so powerful and and the greater society fears them so they need to be controlled cyanite story is uh the one that i struggled with the most uh cyanite is a very like um headstrong character which um is not always my favorite um and uh, she is already at the fulcrum and she is like fairly powerful um 
And then she gets sent out on this um, mission with a ten ringer, which is like the most powerful of origins, um, to to go to this far off city and move this coral reef, which is all really like scientifically interesting, but hard to like for me to um, for me to integrate into the story because there's so much going on, um, and. There's a lot of sex in uh, in uh, uh, Cyanite's um, storyline, <laughs> um, but but it's it's not. Yeah, I guess for those of you who don't like to read like romantic storylines, I wouldn't necessarily say that's what it is. She takes it in really interesting directions, uh, and there's also some like poly representation there. Um, yeah, it, it goes on off on like quite an interesting tangent and even like thinking about, you know, it's a big book, but it's not the biggest book and how far all three of these um, storylines go in this book is just like, wow, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> okay, I um, feel like I've at least given like some structure to what this is about i'm sure i've like forgotten some like integral uh, aspects, um, but um bottom line is it's an incredibly inventive um uh high fantasy uh science fiction um and it did win the hugo in uh 2016 like super well deserved i am very excited uh to read the rest of the books i believe it's a trilogy um and yeah it just taking things uh in a way that I'm not sure how she she thought of this and then um building it so in such detail um in a way that's just so fully fleshed out it's just like um one of those books that you feel very like um confident about with the writer like that they are going to take you on a journey that they know where it's going um and and I do find that that can be quite comforting as a reader even when you're like am I missing something because you know that like you're going to get where the author wants you to go uh by the end of it and and really um appreciated the like the uh I guess uh the characters um uh, I think that's what I really should have asked you, Allison. Is are you do you like character or plot? And I think that this book is like a pretty amazing um, mesh between the two. Uh, and because it's so dense, you can really kind of focus on which whichever you prefer or both. Yeah. So uh, thank you for for um, giving me an opportunity to revisit this because I am like remembering how much I enjoyed it the first time and how much uh, I can get out of it by reading again. Plus, I still have all of those other books to look forward to. So that is N.K. Jemison's The Fifth Season, uh, which is part of a series. Thank you, Fiona. That's probably my favorite book on Ellison's list, but I'm afraid to talk about it. So I'm glad you picked it up because I'm like, I'm not going to try to summarize that book because um, it is, like you said, so many things going on. It's amazing. So Ellison, tell us about why this book is on your list. Yeah, so it is a dense, beautifully written beautifully world-builded book and I think for me um, to answer your question I'm definitely more of a character person than a plot person I love plot but I I'm here for characters and the relationships between characters and seeing characters develop over the course of the book which is why one of the reasons why I love The Broken Earth um, you get to see Essun's story you get to see um the way all of these stories intertwine and like you said realizing oh that person's that person is such a sort of thundershock moment the first time you're reading this book and also like you said it's eminently rereadable you can go back and see things that you didn't see before because now you know sort of not necessarily the twist but the the way things are actually arranged um I am a huge fan of books with great world building, and I think N.K. Jemisin does an amazing job with world building across her books. 
Um, so that's sort of the big reason that this is on my list. And it's just, like I said, it's a beautiful read. It's brutal. Like I, I found it difficult to read in parts, but this really, this whole trilogy is fantastic. And I cannot recommend the Broken Earth trilogy enough. And Fiona give you the book, book number two. I have book number two. That's the only one I could lend you. So um, <laughs> anyway. So Fiona, out of one to ten, book twin possibility? I'd say based on this book only, uh, probably like six. Um, you know, I feel like, like I said, I like I, I theoretically like fantasy, but I find them like really challenging. So I don't do it very often. But I think hearing Allison say that they, um, you know, they like speculative fiction, fantasy and horror. Those are all ones that I dabble in, but that they really like to w read widely. I feel like I have pretty much a, like the exact same approach, but with like grounded more in like historical fiction um, and contemporary um, and then go off to those other things when I and come back to what's comfortable. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. I guess we'll find out more as we hear more books from Allison and see where we're at. So um, I'm going to go next, I think, because I have something quite different. Um, the book that I chose from Allison's list is probably the outlier maybe on the list and also outlier on my own reading because it is a nonfiction and you all know I don't really read them. But the ones that I do read are probably more akin to this one that um on that is on Allison's list because it's one of those about like a very niche subject that only like five people in the world care about kind of topic. I mean, granted that the one that Allison has is definitely has a much broader appeal, but it's that type of nonfiction that I generally like to read. Also, because when I saw the book, I'm like, why does this sound so familiar? Oh, it's because I recognize the cover and someone else in the house owns a copy of this. So I figured that would be convenient. So the book that I chose is Letter Perfect, the A to Z History of Our Alphabet by David Sachs, which I believe lives in Canada. Um, as the subtitle of the book suggests, this is the story of how our 26 letters in the alphabet came to be and how we arrive at 26 of them and the changes that they have gone through. So the book started sort of with a general history, giving us an overview of the origins of sort of our alphabet system. And then there's one chapter devoted to each of the letters so that we can take a deeper dive into them. Um, the sounds that are associated with the letter, you know, how the pronunciation pronunciation changes over time. Also the written form of the letter, um, what the original shape of the letter looks like and how that has morphed into the letter that we know today. It also talks about the connotations of the letters. What do we think when we think of the letter S? You know, what kind of emotions does it evoke? And how popular and how frequently the letter is being used and how that has changes. How Q went from being the suspicious letter, the one that nobody thinks they need, into the cool alternative, like the word in, in cool words like quantum or Q in Star Trek. And why so many place names start with the letter B, for example. So you get these little tidbits and trivia about letters. We also get origin stories and possible origin stories, I guess, of how certain terms and phrases came to be. Um, so for example, why do we call it a plan B? Why do we have the phrase fit to a T or minding your P's and Q's? Where do these all come from? So the book in each of those chapters talks a lot about that. And so you can tell this is a book for language lovers, you know, like I think we have many of those on the show here. And it is definitely perfect if you love language um, and, and you love trivia about language. And I think even though this you can tell from the book is, is not designed like a coffee table book, but I think it's it's. That's probably how the best way to read it. Um, pick it up and then, you know, read a letter every now and then. I think that's probably the way to go. Um, that's not my style of reading. Um, so I think for me, what I have issue with probably is more the organization of the material in the book. Um, and it's probably my bias because when I when I picked this book up, I was expecting kind of maybe more of a story of the letters that sort of a, a narrative that sort of carries through the book. Um, and what I find what it does right now with 
each chapter doing a letter is that it can get a little bit repetitive because, you know, like many of the letters come from the same source. They have a similar kind of like story and evolution. And and I think the format of the each of the chapter is also quite similar. You know, first we talk about the sound, then we talk about the letters and the written form. And then, so it's, it feels kind of a little bit repetitive to me. And for me, the most interesting parts of the book is the relationships between the letter. You know, like how N has to change the name because it was placed next to M. And so like now the name changed, you know? So I find those like connections about certain letters really, really interesting. And that's what, sort of what I was looking for, you know, like to learn more about the rivalry of letters between the C and K and Q and who won and who lost, you know, like it was, those are like really interesting. And I, I almost wanted to like be able to, you know, like, Every, and I end up what and that's sort of what I end up doing. I, I read the letter C and then I'm like, oh no, I need to jump to K now because I want to know what happened to K and Q, you know, like so that's kind of how I ended up reading it. Um and because because those to me is sort of that that story was 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 what interests me. And it's also really uh, cool to see how the same letters um in other languages, how they were used, how they were developed, you know, and, and based on the sound that that particular language need and what letters were used what letters were discarded um, and you know what are some of the ones that may be closer to what we believe the original sound to be so it's interesting to see those kind of bigger picture and that was sort of what I I really enjoyed about the book and I wish that it was sort of formatted in that way what's also really interesting to me and comforting to me reading this book is that as someone who comes from a language that does not have an alphabet system, one of the things that I will never ever understand in my life, and I I have given up, like I'm just like this is I'm I will never learn this, is all the rules surrounding pronunciations. It does not make any sense. You have 26 letters, you should just have 26 sounds. Like, what is the deal here with all the like different variations depending on what letters you are next to, depending on how you know the word end? Like, it's very, very confusing for people who don't you know, have like who who comes from like, well, I mean, especially for me, I think just because like we don't even have a syllabic kind of like uh or you know like or alphabet system. So that makes it super, super confusing. Um and it was comforting to read in the book that I'm not the only one because there were throughout history lots of people who have suggested many, many times that, hey, why don't we just have this letter represent that heart G sound that we need? And we'll just use another letter to represent this other sound. Why, why, why do we have to get like the same letter to have so many sounds? But alas, letters got dropped, not added. Many letters, you know, that represent that specific sound that we need. Now other less letters have to pick up the slack and, you know, do all double, triple duties. So um, yeah, so it was kind of nice to see that, you know, like that that this is is a, it's interesting. I mean, I guess that's part of it. It's interesting how English developed and and in fact, I know many people think a lot of other, like, you know, there's always rankings of like, what are the languages that are easy to learn? English is actually quite hard because of, in for me, the pronunciation part of it. But anyway, so Alison, um, tell us why this specific nonfiction end up on your list. Okay, so one thing you may or may not know about me is that I am a huge language nerd. I love language. I love languages. I love the history of languages. So this book... Um, really kind of helped not necessarily kick that off for me, but really got me interested in linguistics as a topic. I read this book in high school for the first time, and it actually is the reason or one of the big reasons that I ended up going into linguistics for my undergrad. Um, I remember going to the university and talking to the linguistics department and the profs just being surprised that there was a high schooler who knew what linguistics was. Um, so this book was really formative for me in that way, um, which is one of the reasons that it made my top 10 list, because it just affected the path of my life. Um, I love language. I think that the stories of all the letters are really interesting and the story of how the alphabet developed. Um, Virginia, I absolutely hear you on the confusing nature of how different letter combinations and the way letters are in different words are pronounced at different differently at different times. Totally understand you. It doesn't make sense. It's all like vestiges of historical stuff and us stealing words from other languages. 
Um, but yeah, I, I picked this book because it actually affected the path of my life. It, it put me on the path towards studying linguistics in undergrad, and that eventually put me on the path towards uh, librarianship. So it is on my list because of that. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, books. Uh, so I, I would say, based on this book, <laughs> Based on this book, you know, like, I mean, like, and, and I think looking at your list, I would say probably for me, maybe a four, three or four. I know what other things you read. That's why I'm kind of like, that's why I, I have to qualify with based on this list. <laughs> but you know what? But you know what? I, I have to say, though, right? Because I think looking at the the fantasy and, you know, on, on your list, for example, like, it really shows Fantasy is not one thing. There are so many different kinds. And I think like, you know, Sadie and I always talk about like how we both like fantasy, but Sadie likes very different fantasy than me. And I feel like that might be the case here. I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out. Um, Because I also know some of the other books that you have brought up and I love those. So yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, all right. Sadie, what book did you pick from Allison's list? All right. Um, so I, when I looked at your list, Allison, I was actually quite happy to see this book on it. Um, this is a book that I read for the first time back in high school. Um, and I read it a few times back in high school. And I not only read it, but I uh, performed scenes from it um, back in high school. So I was uh, pretty familiar with it, um, pretty familiar with the source material as well um, when I first read it. So it was fun to, to get a chance to revisit it because I had not read it since then. Um, so the book that I chose or the play that I chose is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Um, we're going to hide the VPL signs here. Don't see those. <laughs> so yes, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead by Tom Stoppard. Now, people probably don't want to hear this, but I'm going to have to give a very brief overview of the play Hamlet by William Shakespeare in order to talk about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. So I'm going to do my best to give a very, very brief overview of the play Hamlet. It is also, I haven't read Hamlet in quite a while. Um, so we'll see how good, how good I do. So we have Hamlet. We have the Prince of Denmark. The Prince of Denmark, his father is dead. Uh, his mother uh, grieved for a while, but has now remarried his uncle. One night, a ghost appears to Hamlet of his father and tells him that he has not died by natural causes. He was murdered. He was murdered by uh, the uncle that is now married to Hamlet's mother. And he requests that Hamlet avenge him. Please, son, avenge me. So Hamlet sets out on a course to avenge his father and to prove that Claudius, his uncle, was the person that killed him. So Hamlet enlists a group of actors to present a play telling the exact story of how Claudius killed his father. Um, they do this. He was trying to get the get his uncle to see the play and confess everything. Don't think it works very well. Um, he addresses his mother at one point and uh, thinks that somebody is spying on their conversation. He takes his sword. He drives it between the curtains. He kills Polonius, a lovely elderly gentleman who acts as uh, advisor to some people. Um, so he kills Polonius. Oh, no, he has killed Polonius. All at the same time as this is happening, there is Ophelia, who I, oh, I think is Polonius' daughter. Oh my gosh, it's been so long. Yes, okay, I'm getting a nod, yes. Uh, so Polonius has two children, Laertes and Ophelia. Um, Hamlet and Ophelia are kind of together, although nobody really knows. Um, Hamlet tells her that... Uh, <laughs> He basically snubs her and tells her that um, it, there's no point in her trying to be with anyone. She should just go to a nunnery and become a nun because um, that's what she should do. Um, Ophelia, taking this and getting very upset with this, kills herself. Unfortunately, she drowns herself in a river. Um, Hamlet, people are not entirely sure if he is uh, in his right mind, out of his mind. They have no idea. Anyways, the play ends with Hamlet being sent to England. And uh, what we learn later is that he has been sent to England to be executed, but he comes back to Denmark. He escapes when the ship is attacked by pirates. He escapes, comes back to Denmark to kill absolutely everybody. And including himself, they all die. Now, you may have noticed that in this description, I have not mentioned Rosencrantz or Guildenstern. And that is because they are very minor characters in the play of Hamlet. Uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are talked about as two of Hamlet's childhood friends. 
And um, they have been enlisted by Claudius to try and figure out what is wrong with Hamlet, because no one really knows what's wrong with Hamlet. Um, they are not sure, as I mentioned, if he is in his right mind, if he is not in his right mind. Um, so Claudius has enlisted um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to see if they can figure out what exactly is wrong with Hamlet. So they come and they talk to him and they try to make sense of what's going on. Um, Hamlet doesn't really trust them as much as they were childhood friends. He doesn't really trust them. Um, after Hamlet kills Polonius, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are tasked with bringing Hamlet to England. And they are on the boat with Hamlet. Um, and they bear a letter from Claudius saying um, to the King of England that when they get to England, Hamlet is going to be executed. Hamlet discovers this letter. He rewrites the letter and changes uh, the letter with a new one of his own, stating that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are to be killed. Pirates attack the ship. As I said, Hamlet escapes, goes back to Denmark to kill everybody. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are given one final mention. In the final scene, Laertes lies dead. Hamlet lies dead. Claudius lies dead. Gertrude lies dead. Horatio is the only person who is still alive and a messenger from England, comes and delivers the line, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. That's all that they get. One final line to tell the world that they are dead. So Tom Stoppard has taken these characters, these very minor characters, and given them their own story. And Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead takes place within Hamlet. Um, so within the play itself, you get scenes from Hamlet, you get snippets from Hamlet, um, but the main focus of it is on what Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are doing while all of those scenes are taking place. Um, it is a very absurdist, um, existential kind of play. Uh, there's a lot of confusion for the characters and thus a lot of confusion for the reader or the viewer, um, depending on how you are watching it, um, where Rosencrantz and Guildenstern have no idea what's going on because Shakespeare didn't tell them what was going on. And Tom Stoppard kind of plays on that. Um, so they're constantly um, playing at questions, which is what it sounds. They ask each other questions back and forth. Um, you lose if you don't answer in the form of a question. Um, and so they're they're playing at questions. They're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, all that they can remember is that a messenger woke them up and they've been summoned. And so they finally get to the castle and they learn that, okay, they have to try and figure out what's going on with Hamlet, but they don't know how to do that. And as these other scenes are playing out, they're trying to figure out how do we figure out what's going on with Hamlet? What is our role here? We've been told that we're childhood friends of Hamlet. I guess that's true. Um, there's a lot of play between which one of them is Rosencrantz and which one of them is Guildenstern, um, which is a lot of fun kind of uh, banter back and forth where not only themselves, but also the other characters in the play will refer to one is Rosencrantz and then the other is Rosencrantz and then change it to one is Guildenstern and then the other is Guildenstern. Um, so there's just like a lot of, confusion that surrounds the whole play and that that's a lot of the fun of it um is as I said, the characters have no idea what's going on so you don't know what's going on um so yeah so you you kind of follow the story of hamlet it does you you do need a knowledge of hamlet i would say in order to read uh, rosencrantz and guildenstern are dead just because it it references a lot of scenes it does include some very kind of small snippets from the actual play of hamlet but knowing the general storyline of Hamlet is very, very useful. Um, also knowing some of the actual speeches from Hamlet is very, very useful um, because they'll say like one line of the speech and then make reference to the rest of it, but not actually include it. Um, so yeah, and it, it just basically follows their story. Um, in the end, they end up on the boat. Um, once again, they're very confused. They're not sure what's going on. Um, it, employs the players quite a bit the actors um so they're the player is kind of a major character in the show um they meet him at, in the forest before they get to the castle um he's at the castle performing with his troupe this um this play that's supposed to convince claudius to confess um and then they he shows up on the boat um as well and they enact a lot of the scenes from hamlet um but as as this acting troupe 
maybe I have done an okay job explaining what that is. I think that if you are confused by it, then you're in the right place. Um, and that's what you're supposed to be feeling. Um, it uh, was written in 1967, but didn't kind of get a lot of um, acclaim until 1996 when it premiered at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Um, there was also a movie made um, with uh, Gary Oldman and Tim Roth, I believe, um, in 1990s, so before it kind of premiered there, um, which I think is worth watching 100%. I think it's a wonderful adaptation of uh, of the play. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love it. I, I, I don't know if it's just appealing to the nostalgia of having read it and performed part of it in high school, um, but I absolutely love it. So if you're looking for something that's a pretty quick read, I mean, all plays you should be able to read in in under two hours or so. Um, so if you're looking for something that's a quick read, if you like Shakespeare, but want a kind of a play on Shakespeare a little bit, if you don't like Shakespeare and want to see, uh, see it turned on its head, um, then yeah, I, I really liked it. So Allison... Why did you put Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead on your list? So I mentioned that I love characters and I think that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead is a really interesting character study of these minor characters from Hamlet, which is a play that I also really like. Um, I also just love the absurdism of the play and the sort of meta narrative nature of it, where it's it's commenting on Hamlet, but it's also commenting on itself and it's commenting on the nature of plays in general and the cyclical nature of being played and replayed. And it's just such an interesting little play. And I also love the movie that you mentioned with uh Gary Oldman and Tim Roth. It's, I think, a fantastic adaptation. Tom Stoppard worked on it himself. So you know that it's got the stamp of approval of the author. Um, I just love the the twisty, tricksy nature of this play and the way that it's kind of always something new when you look at it from a different perspective. So it really rewards rereading and rewatching. Um, I think that's the case with a lot of the books on my list, uh, that they're books that I like to reread because I always find something new when I come back to them. So, yeah, it's it's a little bit of nostalgia for I read it in university, not in high school, um, but also just that love of narrative, which is something that I am a huge fan of is just the way that it skewers narrative and plays with it and turns it on its head, like you said. So yeah, I think it's just a really great play. And I, I will also say um, in regards to book twins, I realized I did not answer that part of it. Um, based on this, I'd say we're probably pretty high. Um, but I think that kind of similar to what Virginia was saying, I think that kind of we have similar genres that we enjoy but I'm not sure if the parts of those genres are going to match entirely so I think um just kind of looking at your list and and looking at the fantasy on your list um I'm not I'm, yeah I'm not sure I, I'm gonna say a solid five for book twins for us um I think that there will be some crossover I really do um but I think that uh yeah we're not not fully aligned Well, we'll find out. We'll find out, right? You know, and I think it's because part, I know I'm not not for you, uh, Sadie, but I think for me, it's just because I I'm so specific about what I like, you know. And I think Allison, as Allison said, like you know, they like to read a little bit more widely, which I don't. <laughs> I have like I have my nonsense, you know. As you know, I need specific nonsense, and so um, yeah. So <laughs> anyway, all right, Corinne, what book on Allison's list? list did you pick i didn't so much pick this book um as i forgot the book that i was going to read on my desk went on vacation and came back and was like oh pants um thankfully i have actually read most of the books on your list um and i'm going for kind of like an easy one um just because i can talk about this book and i remember it and i have some extremely strong feelings about it and like lots of follow-up questions for you because you have truly chosen the wildest route um, into a series in that you chose the second book in a series 
and then also said that you didn't really care for the rest of the series, which is hard for me to understand, um, especially because I hated the second book so much. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll have a lot to talk about. Um, so I am talking about uh, as mentioned, a trilogy. Um, I can't really talk about the second book because you need <laughs> you need a lot of context for the first book. Um, so I'm gonna have to talk about like the gist of this. Uh, so I am going to talk about the classic, classic kind of kids YA series, um, recently adapted into a BBC miniseries with the guy from Hamilton, the guy from Hamilton, Lynn Manuel Miranda, Lynn Manuel Miranda uh, in a balloon, um, which is mostly what I remember from it. Um, so this is a world of demons, but not demons in the way that you think of them. Um, alternate Oxfords, dust, gobblers, angels, missing children, uh, armored polar bears, silver tongue girls, and very, very sharp knives. We are talking, of course, of Philip Holman's series, His Dark Materials. Uh, there are three books in it, uh, Northern Lights and or The Golden Compass, the second book, which is the worst book, The Subtle Knife, and then the third book, which is the second worst book, because there are elephants on roller skates, uh, which is The Amber Spyglass. Um, and so we are following Lyra, which is a very like slanted way of saying liar, um, which I only kind of realized as an adult and felt really stupid about. Um, and she's a liar. She's a rapscallion. She's 12 years old. She's growing up in kind of like an alternate Oxford, but not really an alternate Oxford having spent their time there. They're all very stuffy and they love their research. Um, and she mostly spends her time with kind of like the street children getting into scrapes and telling stories about it. Um, what is interesting about this alternate uh, world is that everyone has a demon, which is Damon, Demon, Matt Damon, um, which is kind of like, okay, here we go, an external representation of your soul, but it's an animal and you chat with it. Um, and when you're a kid, it kind of like shifts into different animals. So it could be like a butterfly or a dragonfly or a monkey or a tiger or whatever. Tiger would be super inconvenient. Some people had geese and that was also inconvenient. Anyways, so it like shifts forms and it's like your soul. Um, and everyone has one of these. And when you're a kid, it shifts. And then when you kind of become an adult and boring, um, your demon kind of like settles into one form that kind of like represents you in a big way. And so part of the fun of the book is like you see someone and like you see, oh, their demon is a, a lynx. They're probably bad news. Um, which kind of is horrible now that I think about it. Anyways, um, so yes, everyone has this kind of representation. Her representation is called ooh, Pantalimon or something like that. Um, there are a lot of really long names in this book, uh, which is a struggle. And so she is kind of sneaking around in Jordan College, where a very illustrious visitor has come to present to all of the masters there. As they are sitting in the room getting ready, there is the master of the college and this Lord Azriel. Uh, this is why I have a hard time with high fantasy. Um, they sitting down and the Lord Azrael kind of goes out of the room and she witnesses the master of the college try and poison the drink that Lord Azrael is about to imbibe. Um, she manages to intervene and save Lord Azrael, not before he like shakes her up a little bit um, and is able to, with his permission, sit in uh, secretly on the presentation that he is giving to the masters of the college. He is wanting to mount an expedition to the north, where he believes in the northern lights he has captured pictures of an alternate world. He is interested in the study of dust, this kind of magical substance that's in the world that is very, very attracted to adults, but seems to be repelled by children. And so the dust in the northern lights seems to give way to an alternate world through it. And Lord Azrael would like to study it and go into this new world. The problem with all this sci-fi nonsense is that the world that Lyra is in is governed over by a very oppressive capital C church. And the idea of there being alternate worlds, there being alternate realities is straight up heresy. And they don't love heresy. So 
despite all of the risks, the college decides to fund his expedition and uh, he kind of sets off to do this thing. Um, and then Miss Coulter arrives and she's very cool and I love her and I'm not like cheering for her, but I like her vibes. <laughs> Um, she shows up, she has a monkey who's kind of a jerk, and she gently kidnaps Lyra to come live with her in London and be glamorous and fabulous. Um, but before Lyra grows, the master of the college gifts her an alethiometer at best guess, which is a strange compass-like device which also always tells the truth. So Lyra is able to ask a question of this compass, and by reading all the different symbols on the outside circle, she's able to determine the truth of the matter and even potentially the future. Uh, with this, she goes to London, but before she embarks on this adventure, her best friend, one of those street urchins, urchins um is kidnapped by the gobblers this strange mysterious almost fairy tale like boogeymen who are roaming around oxford and kidnapping children um but that's too bad for him so she's off to london to have a great time and then of course nothing is as it seems she's got an evil monkey like what did she expect Anyways, nothing is as it seems and so she has to embark on an adventure to come and find her friend there's polar bears and then whatever that's the first book and then the second book starts with a totally different character that you have no inkling of what he's about he's extremely boring and annoying and he's got a lot of problems and he's in the boring real world and the betrayal that i felt when i first read this series was insurmountable I like Lyra. I think she's a very interesting character. Sorry, Allison. I think Will's boring and sad. Um, and he's got a lot of problems. His dad is missing. His mom is suffering from mental health problems. But it's fine because he gets a sharp knife and solves all those problems. Um, yeah, so the second book, The Subtle Knife, picks up kind of in a totally different era. And it just kind of like expands the world and the thesis that Philip Pullman is building. Um... <laughs> Philip Pullman... So this book was, uh, the first book was published in 1995, and it was incredibly controversial at the time, and in some ways still is, uh, was the subject to a lot of book bannings and protests, um, because the book at its core is a critique of church, uh, the Catholic Church, Christianity, and religion, which are bold topics to be picking for kind of like a, a wire children's books. And I think in that way, it was incredibly groundbreaking. Um, I think maybe if I had to guess, Allison, what you were like interested in and kind of looking at your list is you you really like good writing. And Philip Pullman is a great writer, despite the elephants. Um, his world building is fantastic. And I think if I had to guess why you like this book so much is because he kind of expands the world in this one in a much more interesting way than he, I think he does in the first one. Um, we learned that there are many, 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 many parallel worlds, some of them with a lot of spooky dooky things in them. Um, and that the shark knife that Will has allows him to go through and navigate the different worlds. Um, I think the books stand up um, despite being published so long ago. I think they still are immensely readable and immensely interesting. I would argue the first book is structurally perfect. Uh, the second book has a lot of problems, but it's fine. Um, and if you are kind of like an adult looking to see a really masterful writer and storyteller kind of like tackle a really big world building series sometimes successfully sometimes unsuccessfully i think that it's still worth going back to pick up um yeah so I, i'm interested i'm deadly interested as to why you picked the second book instead of you know the first one I, 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 uh... so i did not mean to imply on my list that i don't like the rest of the trilogy i do like the whole trilogy but my favorite of the three is the subtle knife and I can see by your face, Corinne, that you don't quite understand why. Um, I, you were right in that the world building is a big thing for me, but um, I'm going to have to disagree with you. I love Will Perry as a character. Um, I think he is really interesting. Um, as For me, this book was really formative. Um, this whole series was really formative when I was young. Um, 
I really like the Golden Compass, um, but it's it felt like a fantasy novel that in some ways I'd read before. Like I I love fantasy, but I got to the subtle knife and it was something new. It was it was about this boy who has been forced to grow up too quickly. It finding himself in another world. The the subtle knife, the idea of the subtle knife, this knife that can cut through anything, including the walls between different realities, is so compelling to me. Um, the fact that Will has to sacrifice to be able to use the knife. His fingers get cut off and the wound doesn't really heal um, is so compelling to me again um i find the whole series really compelling and i really love it but will perry is a character that i just connected with on a really deep level um at a really formative age and so that's the reason that the subtle knife is so important to me as a book so um for those of you who are listening, when I sent in my list, I put several series on my list and said, but if I had to pick one, I picked the first book. But for this one, I said The Subtle Knife specifically because it is my favorite of the trilogy and I I love Will Perry. I'm sorry, Kareen. I, I identify very strongly with this character and it was really formative for me growing up. I also love the world building. Like you said, I think Philip Pullman is a masterful writer. Um, there are things that he does that are weird. I actually liked the roly poly elephants, um, not because of the idea of them, but more of the idea of trying to figure out their language when Mary is having to learn how to speak elephantese. Um, that, part of the book was really interesting to me I think Amber Spyglass is a very it's a very it's trying really hard to do some things and it doesn't necessarily accomplish everything that it's trying to do it's very ambitious that's the word I was looking for but um it is still really good in my opinion, I think my favorite, the way that I would rank these books is I like The Subtle Knife the best, then Golden Compass, then Amber Spyglass, but they're all pretty close. Fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. Again, I I never take any offense at anyone disagreeing with me. As someone who has very strong opinions about things, I, I totally understand. Um, In terms of like our book compatibility, I think the fundamental kind of like divide that I share with a lot of people on this podcast, Virginia, I think Sadie as well, is that if if we had to rank book uh, like plot versus character, I actually find plot more compelling than I do characters. Um, So even uh, unless I unless I hate them, um, but if I find a book's plot very interesting the character kind of becomes secondary so I think in that way it, it, it's a big divide um but I think what we do have in common is I also like nonfiction. I like I love a good love a good memoir I love a good like interesting deep dive into something so I think we definitely have that in common um I don't mind a fantasy book but obviously have a really hard time um pronouncing things um is difficult for me um, because unlike Fiona, I don't listen to audiobooks, so I have no context, none, just just the ramblings in my head. But I also really love language, um, so I think we have that in common. So I, I I don't know. We'll 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 find out because again, a top ten is not is maybe not always representative of who you are as a reader. It's just the books that were really like important and informative. And I think that was so. What was so interesting about your list is that it wasn't necessarily maybe like your favorite books of all time, but like very formative books. And I think that's so interesting of how you how you approach that is like these have been kind of like pivotal reads that have like shifted the course of your life in a way. And so I think that was that super interesting. So yeah, I think that we have like a big divide on that, but I think that there are definitely things that we have in common. So I'm excited, excited to see what you pick up and talk about. Yes, absolutely. No need to apologize because we argue here all the time, Allison. Don't worry. Everybody hates something that Kareen likes and the other way around. It's Hello Calvino, for instance. Um, so yeah. Um, yes, so yes, you know, and it we we're so glad to have that chance to get to know you through your books. That was really, really fun. And I'm glad that like somehow we all end up make, picking a book that 
represent maybe a different aspect of, you know, you as a reader. So that was really fun too, you know, so that we get to know you from all the other interests that you have, not just, you know, like reading. So that was great. Um, I would love to, like, we should do an episode on like just pivotal reads. I think that would be a really fun one because we haven't really done that for the rest of us, right? So it would be interesting. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe. Anyway. All right. Okay. So, well, thank you. And welcome again, Alison. You know, we're really, really excited to have you here. And I know you're going to bring us lots and lots of great books. So we're looking forward to those. So yeah, thank you everybody uh, for joining us for Keep It Fictional. And we will see you again next week. Bye-bye.